All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I, I can. can. You see Matthew on the screen? Mm -hmm. yes. There he is. All right, well, let's pray and let's get going. Lord God, we give you thanks for this time we're able to spend together as we uh, delve deeper into your word, a word that brings hope and healing, a word that continues to guide us, a living word that moves out ahead of us, prepares a place for us. Uh, we thank you for uh, being able to gather for a night of worship right before, and uh, we thank you for, for music and song opportunity to give thanks and praise. We ask that you open our hearts, that you speak to our, our spirits and our minds today. We ask all this in your holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Well, we're in week three of uh, the Beatitudes, and every week one of my intentions is to broaden the context a little bit for us uh, because the Beatitudes weren't written in a vacuum. Um, they weren't um, just part of some uh, writing that uh, didn't have any context to it. And sometimes scripture uh, kind of feels like it's been kind of placed and taken out of context or it's in a vacuum. And, and so um, uh, last week we talked a lot about the, uh, the cultural context that Jesus grew up in. Um, the political and socioeconomic context that uh, was all around um, for the hundreds of years and then how the, you know, how Herod and Herod's sons try to live into, uh, try to be little, little Rome and uh, what that did to the socioeconomic um, um, kind of livelihood of the people that are gathered here. Um, and then we talked a little bit about um, um, uh, Luke and the difference between Luke and, Luke and Matthew. So today I want to, I want to, uh, so each week I'm trying to place the Beatitudes in the context and, 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 and the, the kind of the tradition. And Matthew is, is a tradition. Luke is a tradition. John's a tradition. Mark's a tradition. And um, Matthew has a very particular way of seeing uh, what G and, and telling the story that uh, we've talked about every, Every one of these gospel writers are telling the story a little bit differently and have different stories. Some of them are the same, um, but uh, some of them are different and they tell them differently. So we'll give you an overall structure of what's going on in, in Matthew. Um, there are a lot of really, really smart people. One of the fun things that I, that I um, one of my seminary classes was you, you had to choose I, one of my, uh, um, uh, can I have to choose which gospel you wanted to dive deep into? And I ended up being able to dive into deep into Matthew and then also into the gospel of John um, because I was there long enough to they change their rules <laughs> for the curriculum. You know, typically you go to seminary for four years. I think I was in it for about eight to ten. So I got a little bit of a little bit of everything, but I got to dive deep into the Gospel of John and also the Gospel of Matthew. And I'm going to walk you through a couple of uh, different ways people think about this. And I think it's uh, it's it's part of our tradition, even though as Christians we don't we don't like doing that a lot because we feel like there should be one answer. Um, um, there, there are basically two siblings that I think about that have come out of Judaism uh, from the time of Jesus. You have the Pharisaic Judaism that is still a part of uh, Judaism, is still a part of the Jewish religious, religion and practice. And the other sibling is what we now call Christianity. But our history is Judaism. Um, Christians have tried to remove the Jew from Jesus for a long, long time. Um, but we're going we're gonna to see very clearly, especially in this uh, beatitude that we're talking about today, that this is clearly a, a Jewish um, reality. And we, we can allow ourselves to think a lot more like Jewish rabbis and Jewish thinkers, and, and uh, as we call it, midrash, and 
kind of look at things from different angles, which is what's so rich about uh, the Jewish um, tradition. And so I'm going to show you several different types of structures that people believe Matthew uh, was, was written in. Uh, and that tells you a lot of what people think the, the real story of what Matthew's trying to say is. So basically everyone believes that there's two, there are two main parts of Matthew. That there's this narrative part of Matthew, which is telling a story. You know, Jesus went here, Jesus did this, Jesus talked to this person, um, uh, Jesus uh, uh, walked on the water. I mean, all these kind of narrative uh, telling of the story. And then there's these discourse passages, which is which basically are these passages where Jesus is teaching some spoken communications going on. It's not a story about Jesus and what about Jesus is doing, but what Jesus is actually saying. And so we have, uh, we can break down the gospel of Matthew. One, one way to break it down is to understand that there's this narrative introduction of Jesus. Um, there's not a lot of teaching in this narrative. Uh, one through four, uh, Jesus is linked closely to uh, this, the Jewish patriarchs of, 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 the, of the day, all the way back, King David, and then back even further, of course. Um, the birth story, the, the infant story, um, uh, having to flee, um, uh, going, coming back, baptized, going out into the desert and, and being tempted. And then you have this discourse these discourse chapters that come next. And that's the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and we're going to link that a little bit later to some Old Testament pieces, the Sermon on the Mount, which is where our, our Beatitudes are contained in. And then it flips to narrative stories in chapter 8 and 9, stories of Jesus' actions. And then it goes to chapter 10, discourse. So as you walk through these, there are five... Um, you know, kind of five equally uh, kind of, uh, of narratives and then discourse. And then you have the last narrative, um, which is uh, the stories of Jesus' death and resurrection. Although you're going to see in it someone else's understanding of Matthew and how they read it, that they actually pull out 28 because 28 is the Great Commission. And that's not a narrative. That's a discourse. That's a teaching. Uh, go. And baptize um, everyone, all nations, um, and that's a, a sure surefire teaching there, or instruction. So this is one way of thinking about the Gospel of Matthew. Again, we don't want to take the Beatitudes out of it. Uh, we need to sit the Beatitudes deep into what Matthew is trying to do. Um, and um, there's another way to look at. Um, the Gospel of Matthew, and it's around this idea of chiasms or this chiastic pattern. And there are many, many places in Scripture where they're, they're, uh, they're, the Scripture is being written in such a way, it's, it's, a, it's a literary uh, tool that the person who's writing this is trying to tell you what's the most important part of what they're telling you. And in Hebrew, and in, especially in Greek, this is one way to, to do that. The text is ordered around a center, that there is a, very, there is a center of that text. There's an A, B on one side, C is the center, and there's a B and A. And the A's correlate, the B's correlate, and the C is the center. So I'm going to give you a quick chiastic uh, look at this kind of technique. Genesis chapter 1, 27. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So if you were to put this in a chiastic pattern, C is, in, is image, basically, image of God. Um, and that is exactly the point of that, uh, that verse. And then B is going to be uh, created uh, created them, or, or humankind, male and female, and then God did the, the, did the creation. Um, and so that's a pattern, of, a, a chiastic pattern. I'll give you another example uh, of this. This is the Gospel of John. In the very beginning of the Gospel of John, there's this long prologue uh, 
And <clears throat> people have put this into a chiastic pattern in that uh, he gave the, 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 the main point of this whole chiastic pattern, this prologue in John, is he gave power to Pete, uh, uh, he gave power to become children of God, all those who believed in his name. I'll give you another uh, look at it. Um, as you can see, uh, if you want to go back and see the recording, <clears throat> the, the words in black are connected. The words in green are connected, pretty much the same thing. The words in blue, same. The words in that maroon color, the words in pink, and that word, those words in that kind of teal color. And then boom, uh, verse 12, those who do believe in him become children of God. So that's a chiastic way of looking at scripture and that the very important part of that is being becoming the children of God. That's what uh, scholars believe John is trying to do uh, with that prologue. So people have done that with the entire gospel of Matthew. And they're claiming in, in some ways that chapter 13 is the very center of the gospel of Matthew. That if you read chapter 13, um, everything else makes sense. Um, you have a sermon in chapter 13, which is pretty much a discourse. Instead of using the word discourse, they use sermon. Then you have narrative stories that match each other in 11, 12, and, and 14, and 17. Another sermon, and all these things they've, they've done. Chapters 1 through 4, chapters 26 through 28 are, are similar. And chapter 13 uh, is considered to be the center of of Matthew, um, and that is the sower parable. That is the parable of the sower and the seeds. Um, basically, what Matthew, what what these scholars are saying is that Matthew um, has Jesus as the sower. Here's here's the seed, um, and uh, and some are gonna some are gonna some that's gonna fall on 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 rocky ground. Some that's gonna fall on the weeds. Uh, some of it's going to fall on a path, and some of it's going to fall on fertile ground. And uh, so there are, there are people who, uh, who see Matthew uh, as the center, that is the center of the entire gospel of Matthew. Um, if you look at it that way, there's a lot of stories where Jesus is trying to, to sow seed, and it ends up being that. It ends up his teachings, some of them fall on the path. Some of them fall in the weeds, some of them fall in the rocky ground, but there are some who uh, are fertile, uh, who are good soil, and are able to, to accept that, that seed, that teaching, and then grow. Um, you, have, you know, Matthew is concerned with telling the story to a church that's growing, um, and so some people think that that would be the center. Um, for me, it's hard to see. Uh, a lot of that, um, but you know, I don't have 20 years of looking at Matthew only. <laughs> some of these, some of these scholars have some time to to figure that out, and they're really really smart too. So uh, that's one way to look at Matthew. But here's a basic structure I think would be helpful for us because that helps us put where the kind of sits us where the Beatitudes really are. There are these chapters of origin. Where does Jesus come from? Why, why is he here? Um, and then there, there's this understanding that Jesus becomes the Messiah. There's words that, that Jesus spoke, there's, that speaks, there's deeds. And the Beatitudes are words uh, that Jesus speaks. Uh, and then there's healings and those kinds of things as well that go along. Then there's this period of time of rejection from others, period of time of understanding for others. So this church is growing. Some people reject it. Some people don't. We heard that this past Sunday, right? Go out, disciples. Go out and bless the house that welcomes you. And if not, shake the dust off your feet and move on. Some people will understand. Some people will reject you. Then Matthew really pushes uh, the whole narrative of Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. Because that's where all the, the big time action is going to be. Um, and then there's the conflict, death, and res resurrection, the conflict between the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Of course, his arrest, his trial, death, and then a resurrection. And then these final instructions that we'll get into a little bit more next week, as well as we put 
the Beatitudes a little bit more into context as well. Uh, so that's kind of a, a way to think through the Gospel of Matthew. And, of course, the Beatitudes are contained in this word. And as Lutherans, we typically call the word a living word, that it's not stuck in some uh, historical uh, framework, but that it's a living word that moves and changes and, and does different things to us at different times. Um, and that's what Midrash really is for, for, for Judaism, is that the word is a living word. It's not in a museum, you know, stuck behind a glass, but it, it is out, it's free, um, it's moving in the world. Um, so that's where the Beatitudes are, Messiah in word and deed. Uh, chapter 5 is, is where it all, all starts. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the Beatitudes breakdown. We've been looking at them. Um, there are, they're broken down in basically two parts. And I also want to let you know that, that there's been a lot of scholarship over the years. There's some people that think there are nine Beatitudes. Um, that that the, um, the the verse 11 and verse 10 and verse 11 are actually two different Beatitudes. However, if you break down the Greek, they're actually saying the same thing. Um, and so that there, there are, um, um, the understanding is that there are eight Beatitudes, not nine, um, even though there's two blessed, one in 10 and one in 11. So the first four, the ones I have outlined in green, are really uh, classic historical uh, conditions of people who God has favor for. Uh, if you look at uh, the Old Testament, the covenant, what's really supposed to be happening to people who are poor, uh, even in spirit, those who are more, and those are th those we talked about it last week, um, whose lives are just wretched and, and, and hurting. Um, this week, the meek, we're going to walk through what that means. Then, of course, hunger and thirst. And then Matthew uh, adds the righteousness piece for that. Um, just traditionally, this is who the prophets in the Old Testament uh, try to protect. Uh, these are the people they go to bat for. Uh, these are the people they go to the kings and, and say, you're blowing it. Uh, you, you've, you've made all these alliances with all these other countries, and you've forgotten your own people. And uh, so that's classically um, what the prophets speak about and what, uh, what God uh, says. If you, if you don't do these things, if there's no poor among you, or if you're caring for the poor, those that mourn the, the, less, the, the, the less than, um, then our covenant is, is uh, as whole. When you don't do that, the covenant is broken. And we're going to talk about the covenant here as well today. Then the ones in blue are basically what Jesus is trying to tell his people, this is what you need to be. You know, he's saying that there are those who are poor in spirit, there are those who mourn, there are all those who are meek, there are all those who hunger and thirst. Um, those are conditions that you're not trying to be. Those are conditions that are part of the reality of life. Now these last four are, be merciful, be pure in heart, be peacemakers. Um, when, when, when you're persecuted, if you do all those things, you will be persecuted for righteousness sake, uh, sake and, um, the, your reward will be great in heaven. So that's how the Beatitudes break down. And that's how, um, um, we see the differences in Matthew and Luke, like we talked about last week. This is just a little bit of a, a review, um, you know, Matthew has a more spiritual connection to the Beatitudes, Luke is straight up, bless you are poor. There's no spirit involved, just poor. Bless you, you are hungry, not for righteousness, but hungry. Bless you who weep, right? Um, um, all these different kind of connections. And then Luke brings in these woes that are, are not explicitly named in the Beatitudes. But if we were going to go into when Jesus in, is in Jerusalem and encountering the Pharisees, uh, you would see some serious woes being thrown their way that are pretty well uh, connected to what Luke has in here. So Matthew does bring in the woes, but he does it much, much later in the story. Um, 
So we'll rewind a little bit, pour in spirit. Um, again, there's echoes of humility, echoes of piety, um, but there is this preferential treatment that God continues to have for the poor, um, not only for the poor, but also those who are poor in spirit, who feel like they don't have God for whatever reason. Um, and uh, God says, well, you, you, you're poor without me. Guess what? You, you're going you're gonna to have me. Uh, I'm with you even if you don't know it. Um, and sometimes that's true, right? When we're in, in serious situations, we're not sure where God is until we look back. And then uh, I think I talked about the, um, what is that, uh, Footprints, um, the Footprints poem. Um, that used, I used, I was like, oh, that was really cool when it came out. And then it was everywhere. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is getting to be cheesy. But it's true um, uh, that when we look back, we can see that God had never abandoned us. And this, the, this last week, those who mourn for they will be comforted. Um, uh, not necessarily a personal term, even the wealthy mourn, but more in line of their circumstances being wretched, a, collected, a collective disadvantage. Um, we talked about comparing these people to slaves singing in the field. Someday, someday uh, we'll be comforted. Um, and uh, that's the, the piece that lines up, especially with uh, the Gospel of Luke. So today we're going to get into the blessed are the meek they will inherit the earth. Um, this one is a little bit more clear in terms of the, the kingdom, uh, in terms of uh, what does it mean for the kingdom of heaven? What does it mean to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Well, God's presence, it's a little bit uh, not as um, straightforward. Right here, it's they will inherit the earth. And we're going to see in, in Jewish consciousness how important earth is how important the promised land is. Um, and they've been looking for the promised land, and that's part of their, 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 their story for, since the beginning. But we also need to know that Meek has, a, again, different definitions. Um, blessed are those who are gentle. Blessed are those who are humble. And the Meek is synonymous with the word poor. So, this could be exactly the same as blessed are those who are poor from, from um, the gospel of Luke. Um, we, we, don't, we don't see uh, blessed are the ones who are meek, blah, blah, blah. There's not an overly spiritual uh, connection here that, that Matthew makes. But this does, these first three Beatitudes mirror Psalm 37 and Isaiah 61. Again, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus would have known the scripture texts. Um, and Psalm 31 says, But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. What does that abundant prosperity look like? Um, we're going to find that out in, in a little bit. And then Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me and sent me to bring good news to the oppressed uh, which also is translated as poor, which also is translated as meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, those who mourn, right? The, they're, they're broken. Um, and then to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. So meek, uh, uh, be gentle, humble, poor. But how does that look? Uh, what does that look like in real life? Who are the meek? Well, meek does not mean weak. Let's look at one of the first people were, that were called meek. Um, number and, and humble is the same word. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, this is what it says. Now the man Moses was very humble, very meek, more so than anyone else on the face of the earth. Now Moses was leading the people to the promised land, right? This idea of inheriting earth. Uh, blessed are the humble, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit earth. That's what Moses is doing. He's bringing people to the promised land. Now, he never makes it in, but the people do, and they inherit the earth. And Matthew uh, writes his gospel in a, in, a, in, a, in a deep connection with this person we know as Moses. 
there's this Exodus story that we know about uh, Moses, and we also have this Jesus story. And the chapters um, one through five, this introduction, the origin, who are these people, um, are exactly the same in Matthew with his story of Jesus and then the story of Moses. So this unknown person is born, but he's born under this, um, this kind of cloud of the slaughter of infants. Um, there has been this decree by the Pharaoh that uh, they need to kill every uh, boy, Jew that is born. And of course there's some trickery and Moses gets put in the river and he is saved. Um, again, Moses then goes and after he, he murders somebody, of course he's trying to help, but it's still murder. He goes away, but he returns a hero. And then there's a passage through water and the Red Sea. And then there's this time of temptation, 40 years out in the desert, until they come to the mountain of law giving, where there is this discourse, this teaching um, that's going on. So you have narrative, 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 and then it ends up with this teaching, the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments. Let's look at Jesus' story in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew also includes the slaughter of the infants. Herod has heard about um, this, the Savior, this Messiah that's come, and he orders the slaughter of infants. Well, Jesus and his family, they go to Egypt. And then there's this return of the hero. Jesus comes, he passes through water, which is baptism. He goes out, he doesn't spend 40 years in the wilderness, he spends 40 days in the wilderness being tempted. And he, once he comes out of that temptation and that trial, what does he do? He goes to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and what happens on that Sermon on the Mount? It's the beginning of the teaching, the discourse. So in the story of Jesus, you have story, 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 narrative, 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 and then discourse. And so Matthew is connecting Jesus with Moses and even then saying uh, more than Moses. And this happens a lot. Um, if you remember, we talked about um, that, that uh, a couple weeks back, um, we talked about there's this group of people where everything is being taken away. They're, they've, they're, they're losing their religion. They're losing uh, identity. Uh, their language has been taken away from them. By the time that Jesus is born, they're not even speaking Hebrew anymore. They're, they're speaking Aramaic. Um, everything's been gen, gen, uh, kind of Hellenized, and they're losing everything. What group of people, uh, if, they're, if they're really desperate, what they do is they turn back to the old, and they try to return to the old. The Pharisees return back to the old. They return back to Moses. They turn back to the law. And so you're going to see the clash between those who, the Pharisees, who are following Moses, who has the same narrative story that Jesus has. Um, and you're going to have that, them, that group of people in the Gospel of Matthew clash with Jesus. And you're going to clash with the old wine and the new wine. Um, and you don't put new wine in the old wineskins. Um, that kind of that kind of deal. So let's unpack who Moses was because that helps us understand what does it mean that Moses was meek. Who are the meek? Well, they're not weak. Moses was not weak. Moses was fierce. Moses was violent. Moses was focused. He was confident. Moses was a strong leader. But this is what made him meek. This is what made him humble. He knew it wasn't about himself, and he was always pointing to something else. He knew what his mission was, and in the end, his sacrifice was dying before he made it to the promised land. Wasn't able to get there. 
but he was not weak. And typically we see, we understand people who are meek who are those hiding in the corner, um, you know, rubbing their hands and worried about everything. That's not what meek means uh, in this uh, gospel of Matthew. Let's link that with Jesus. Jesus was not weak. He was fierce. He was even violent. He threw over money, money um, changing tables. Um, he cursed a tree and the tree died. Um, he was focused, of course. He was confident. Of course, he was a strong leader. But it wasn't about himself. He always pointed to something else. He knew what his mission was. And then he moved into the final sacrifice. Now, there's, there's a lot of talk about um, this idea of meek and, and humble, that Jesus was weak when Jesus moved into Jerusalem and had that donkey ride uh, or that ride on that foal. There's a little bit of, of interesting conversation about what kind of animal this actually was. Did he ride on two? Did he ride on one? Here's the reality. Moses knew who he was. And Moses didn't try to be something that he wasn't. Jesus knew who he was as well. Jewish kings did not ride war horses. They didn't have war horses. Jewish kings rode donkeys. So this was not a, a show of weakness that Jesus would ride a donkey into Jerusalem. This was a show of Jesus saying he knew who he was and who he represented. Um, again, meek, humble, but not weak at all. And so then let's go into this idea of the last part, for they will inherit the earth. I talked about meek as a synonym, synonym with poor, and this beatitude can mean those whose wills have been crushed. Um, Luke would probably say that a little bit more. Um, but what I think that, that Matthew is getting at here is a use with Moses and Matthew. Humility as in those who remember who they are. Remember who they are. And that's what the prophets always told the kings and the people. Remember who you, who you are. You're, 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 you are God's children. Um, you know, Every time the Jewish people got into trouble is because they thought they were better than other people around them or didn't live in their, into their humility. They forgot who they were. So in the Gospel of Matthew, there's this very interesting, it's almost a throwaway parable. Matthew's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Um, and uh, just, just it's, there's a firing off in, in uh, Matthew 13. Uh, of course, this is where... Some people have that chiastic uh, understanding that chapter 13 is the, uh, the center of, of the gospel, the sower, and then these, these firing off parables, short little parables. The short little parable says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. And we have to understand how incredibly important land was and the context in which Jesus is telling this, these parables and the story about inheriting the earth, inheriting land. Jesus isn't saying that they're going to inherit the entire world. We think of earth as, you know, the whole, the globe, right? Jesus is talking about the land that would have been promised to the people. And at that certain, port, uh, certain time in history, their land, especially up in Galilee, their land had been taken, been taken by the oppressors and also been taken by the wealthy. See, back in the Old Testament, there's this idea of jubilee and there's this idea of not charging interest. Because what interest did was that, or the year of jubilee was, is that every several, seven years, Debts were forgiven. And if someone had to take out debt to buy some land, if they continued to owe, to owe on that land, they, could they would never be able to make it. So every seven years, debts were canceled. 
and you couldn't charge interest. But what started happening was that the religious leaders over time began to add interest onto the top of what was owed, owed them um, by people who had purchased land. And so the land had been taken and people had to work the land, but what, what was being uh, grown was being taken by the oppressors and the wealthy, not just the Romans, but even the wealthy Jews. And especially we talked about last week, the Herodians and that whole system of taking land, taking cities and, and rebuilding them in honor of Roman uh, Caesars. So when Jesus tells this story, he's hitting a bullseye. He's hitting a sweet spot in the lives of everybody that's hearing that story. And when he says the Beatitudes, uh, blessed are those who know what we're talking about. Remember who you are. Blessed are those who remember who you are. Because if you remember who you are, if you're humble, remembering who you are, you know that land is yours and God will restore your land to you. And so in every field, there's a source of treasure. This guy finds a treasure, uh, or it doesn't say a guy, someone found it. Uh, well, it says he, I guess he, but he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Well, there's a promise of treasure in land, right? I mean, at resurrection, we have land. And that's one of the things that people, people tell you is to, to, you know, to never sell your land because there's a treasure in that land. Because what that land produces is the treasure. The promise of treasure in the land, the meek, the humble, those who remember who they are, remember the covenant that God made with them. The treasure of the field is the covenant. And when kept, it provides all that is needed for everyone. And at a time when land was being used for the very few, this was good news indeed for everybody that heard it. There's a story in the Old Testament about two women, Ruth and Naomi. And everything bad happens to them. Naomi uh, and uh, her family have to leave uh, the area of Bethlehem because there's a famine. And they go to uh, a distant land and they find uh, wives for their kids, two boys named Ruth and Orpah. The two boys die, uh, Naomi's husband dies, and so these women, the most vulnerable people uh, on the, in that area on the planet at that time in history don't know what to do. And Naomi says, I'm going back home and tells Ruth and Orpah, you should do the same. Go back to your family. Well, Ruth makes this beautiful promise. It's one of the promises that we know, uh, one of the most beautiful promises of all time. I'll go, will you go? Your family will be my family. Your God will be my God. When you die and I die, I'll be buried next to you. Uh, just this beautiful promise. But what happens is they come back to the area of Bethlehem. And there are some people that are in that land. And one of them is named Boaz. And Boaz is keeping the covenant. The covenant is that once you harvest from the land, don't harvest everything. Leave a part of your land so that those who don't have anything can come and they can glean from the land. They can provide for their families. Not everybody did that, but Boaz did. Boaz did and ended up uh, Naomi and Ruth ended up being those people that would come after uh, the, the, the land, the field was, was harvested. And in doing so, there's this love affair that pops up and Boaz and Ruth get married and they have a kid. And the kid is the great grandson, uh, King David. And King David then in the gospel of Matthew is linked all the way to Jesus. And so you have this, this amazing thread that goes through that the people that are hearing what Jesus is talking about would automatically have a connection to.
They knew the story. You know, we don't always know the story. Like I said on Sunday, we're, we're, kind, of, um, you know, we're kind of immigrants. Uh, there's a cultural gap between us and what was going on in the context of Jesus' time and even before that. So Jesus is saying to the people, if you remember who you are, if you remain humble and you live by the covenant that God made for you, your land will be restored. And not only that, but it will be yours, especially if you keep the covenant that God has made that actually brought Jesus into this world. Without Boaz, without that land being a treasure, not just for the, uh, the, the people that own it, not just for Boaz, but it, it was a treasure for the whole community. Without that, there's no King David. Without King David, there's no Jesus. So it's this massive link uh, all the way through. And it, it, it's just part of this little tiny thing we call uh, the third beatitude. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So I will stop the, uh, I will stop the recording. If I can do that here.